Chapter 21. Casting my eyes on Mr. Wemmick as we went along to see what he was like in the light of day, I found him to be a dry man, rather short in stature, with a square wooden face, whose expression seemed to have been imperfectly chipped out of a dull edged, with a dull edged chisel. There were some marks in it that might have been dimples if the material had been softer and the instrument finer, but which, as it was, were only dents. The chisel had made three or four of these attempts at embellishment over his nose, but had given them up without an effort to smooth them off. I judged him to be a bachelor from the frayed condition of his linen, and he appeared to have sustained a good many bereavements, for he wore at least four mourning rings, besides a brooch representing a lady and a weeping willow at a tomb with an urn on it. I noticed, too, that several rings and seals hung at his watch chain as if he were quite laden with remembrances of departed friends. He had glittering eyes, small, keen and black, and thin, wide, mottled lips. He had had them, to the best of my belief, from 40 to 50 years. So, were you never in London before? said Mr. Wemmick to me. No, said I. I was new here once, said Mr. Wemmick. Rum to think of it now. You're well acquainted with it now? Why, yes, said Mr. Wemmick. I know the moves of it. So is it a very wicked place? I asked, more for the sake of saying something than for information. You may get cheated, robbed and murdered in London. But there are plenty of people anywhere who'll do that for you. If there's bad blood between you and them, said I, to soften it a little. Oh, I don't think about bad blood, returned Mr. Wemmick. There's not much blood about. They'll do it if there's anything to be got by it. That makes it worse. You think so, returned Mr. Wemmick. Much about the same, I should say. He wore his hat on the back of his head and looked straight before him walking in a self-contained way, as if there were nothing in the streets to claim his attention. His mouth was such a post office of a mouth that he had a mechanical appearance of smiling. We'd got to the top of Hoban Hill before I knew that it was merely a mechanical appearance and that he was not smiling at all. Do you know where Mr Matthew Pocket lives? I asked Mr Wemmick. Yes said he, nodding in, in the direction. At Hammersmith, west of London. Is that far? Well, say, five miles. Do you know him? Why, you're a regular cross-examiner, ain't you? said Mr Wemmick, looking at me with a, an approving air. Yes, I know him. I know him. There was a, an air of toleration or deprecation about his utterance of these words that rather depressed me. And I was still looking sideways at his block of a face in search of an encouraging note when he said that we were at Barnard's Inn. My depression was not alleviated by the announcement for I had supposed that that establishment to be a hotel kept by Mr Barnard to which the Blue Boar in our town was a mere public house. Whereas I now found Barnard to be a disembodied spirit or a fiction, and his inn to be the dingiest collecting of shabby buildings ever squeezed together in a rank corner as a club for tomcats. We entered this haven through a wicket gate and were disgorged into a, an introductory passage which led into a melancholy little square and looked to me like a flat burying ground. I thought it had the most dismal trees in it, the most dismal sparrows, the most dismal cats, the most dismal houses, in number about half a dozen, that I had ever seen. I thought the windows 
of the sets of chambers into which these houses were divided were in every stage of dilapidated blind and curtain. Crippled flower pot cracked glass, dusty decay and miserable makeshift, while to let, to let, to let glared at me from the empty rooms as if no new wretches ever came there and the vengeance of the soul of Barnard were being slowly appeased by the gradual suicide of the present occupants and their unholy internment under the gravel. A frowsy morning of soot and smoke attired this forlorn creation of Barnard, and it had ashes on its strewed on its head, and was undergoing penance and humiliation, like a, a mere dust hole. Thus far from my sight, while dry rot and wet rot and all the other silent rots that rot in neglected roofs and cellars, rot of rat and mouse and bug and coaching stables near at hand, addressed themselves faintly to my sense of smell and moaned, try Barnard's mixture. So imperfect was this realisation of the first of my great expectations that I looked in dismay at Mr. Wemmick. Ah, said he, mistaking me, the retirement reminds you of the country, does it? <laughs> so it does of me. He led me into a corner and conducted me up a flight of stairs, which appeared to me to be slowly collapsing into sawdust, so that one of those days the upper lodgers would look out of their doors and find themselves without means of coming down. We reached, eventually, a set of chambers on the top, top floor. Mr. Pocket Junior was painted on the door, and there was a label on the letterbox. Return shortly. He hardly thought you'd come so soon, Mr. Wemmick explained. You don't want me any more, do you? No, thank you, said I. As I keep the cash, Mr. Wemmick observed, we shall most likely meet pretty often. Good day. Good day. I put out my hand and Mr. Wemmick at first looked at it as if he thought I wanted something. Then he looked at me and said, correcting himself, ah, to be sure, yes, you're in the habit of shaking hands. I was rather confused, making thinking that it must be out of the London fashion to do so. I've got to get you out of that, said Mr. Wemmick, except at last. Very glad, I'm sure, to make your acquaintance. Good day. When we had shaken hands and he was gone, I opened the staircase window and nearly beheaded myself for the lines which drew it up and down had rotted away and it came down like the guillotine. Happily, it was so quick that I hadn't put my head out. After this escape, I was content to take a foggy view of the inn through the windows and crusted dirt and to stand dolefully looking out, adding to myself that London was decidedly overrated. Mr. Pocket Junior's idea of shortly was not mine, for I had nearly maddened myself with looking out of this window for half an hour and had written my name several times in the dirt on every pane in the window before I heard footsteps on the stairs. Gradually there arose before me the hat, head, neckcloth, waistcoat, trousers, boots, and other accoutrements of a member of society of about my own standing. He had a paper bag under each arm and a little dish of strawberries in one hand and was quite out of breath. Mr. Pip, said he. Mr. Pocket, said I. Oh, dear me, he explained. I, I am extremely sorry, uh, but... When there was a coach from your part of the country at midday, I thought you'd come down by that. Uh, the fact is, I've been out on your account. Uh, not that on my excuse, <laughs> for I thought coming to the country, uh, coming from the country, you might like a little fruit after dinner. Uh, so I went to Covent Garden Market to get it. 
for a reason that I had, I felt as my eyes would start out of my head. Nevertheless, I acknowledged his attention incoherently and began to think all this was a dream. Dear me, said Mr. Pocket Junior, this door sticks so. As he was fast making jam of his fruit by res wrestling with the door, while the paper bags were still under his arms, I begged him to allow me to hold them. He relinquished them with an unagreeable smile and combated the, dog, uh, the door as if it were a wild beast. It yielded so suddenly at last that he staggered back upon me and I staggered back upon the opposite door and we both laughed. But still, I felt as if my eyes must start out of my head and that I was having a dream. Pray come in, said Mr Pocket Junior. Allow me to lead the way. I'm rather bare, but I, I, I hope uh, you'll be able to make out tolerably well until Monday. My father thought you'd get on more agreeably uh, through tomorrow with me than with him. And you might like to take a little walk around London. I'm sure I should be very, ba uh, very happy to show you London. As to our table, you won't find it bad, I hope, for it will be supplied from our, uh, supplied from our coffee house downstairs. And it is only right that I should add, at your expense, such being Mr. Jagger's directions. As to our lodging, it's not by any means splendid, because I have my own bread to earn, and my father hasn't anything to give me, and I shouldn't be willing to take it if he had. This is our sitting room, just such chairs and tables and carpet and so forth, you see, as they could spare from home. You mustn't give me credit for the tablecloth and spoons and casters, because they, they, they came to you from the coffee house. This is my little bedroom, rather musty, but Barnard's is musty. This is your bedroom. The, fire, the, fire, the furniture is hired for the occasion, but I trust it will answer for the purpose. If you should want anything, I'll, I'll go and fetch it. The chambers are retired and we shall be alone together. But we shan't fight, I dare say. But dear me, uh, I beg your pardon, you're holding the fruit all the time. Oh, pray me take it from you. I am quite ashamed. As I stood opposite Mr. Pocket Junior, delivering him the bags, one, two, I saw the starting appearance come into his own eyes that I knew to be in mine. And he said, falling back, Lord, bless me, you're the prowling boy. And you, said I, are the pale young gentleman. <laughs>